What's happening everyone? Welcome to episode 3 of the Biomechanics of Running segment. I have finally got around to making a video for all you sprinters out there supporting a the channel. With sprinting, there's so much I want to get my teeth into with this. So I'm going to start by talking about the sprint start, specifically coming out of the blocks. I'm going to split it into today looking at setting up the blocks and getting in your set position and then the initial push off as well. And then in part two, we'll look at the first few steps out of the blocks in the acceleration phase. If if anyone knows any extra details that I'm missing out that I should be aware of, just let me know in the comments because, you know, I'm always looking to learn as well. The sprint start is very different biomechanically to upright or max velocity sprinting. Being the fastest starter doesn't necessarily mean you're going to win a race, even a race as short as 100 meters. It's far more common to see the person who reaches the fastest max speed goes on to win the race rather than the first person to 10, 20, 30 meters. So that makes sort of analyzing a good start quite difficult because you can't simply say, okay, the first person to the fastest time to 30 meters wins sort of thing. See what I mean? But the start is still very important at setting up the rest of your race. It will allow you to reach higher maximum speeds as well. But yeah, let's get into all of that now. Right, we're going to start by looking at the very beginning of the race because, well, that should make sense, right? And we're looking at the set position. The set position is determined by your block positioning, but also your genetic anthropometrics. Since it's so anthropometrically individual, I can't say, and neither can any researcher out there, say that there's a one block position that fits all, you know, it's it's going to be different based on individual constraints. That being said, there are multiple areas that all runners, no matter what your anthropometrics are saying, can learn from to make their start the best it can be. First of these is your block setup. For simplicity, biomechanists sort of split this into three categories. You can either have an elongated position, a medium position, or a bunched position in the blocks. And research suggests that most high level sprinters have a more bunched position. And the reasons for this is it allows you to get your center of mass closer to the starting line. When people talk about being uncomfortable in the blocks, they're talking about having a large sort of pressure on the shoulders at the front. So like if you were to like, if someone was to come and sweep your, your arms away, you'll fall on your face because they are actively holding you up. You want your body center of mass as close to the starting line as possible rather than really far back. I mentioned about there not being one technique that fits all. And as these people suggest, adjusting the blocks to fit athletes individually creates better posture um, when leaving the blocks, which in turn improves the kinematics and associated kinetics, which I'll be discussing later on in the video. So athletes in their study produced more force on the back block when block spacing was adjusted individually. This basically suggests individually playing around with an optimum setup for you to get your center of mass close to the line while still producing optimal forces is key, but more on this later. Block inclination is the next thing to discuss. I used to think that having a really steep block pad would push you more horizontally, which is obviously what you want in sprinting. But I didn't realize the importance of having a pre-stretched muscle tendon structure to produce more force. So by actually reducing the incline angle of your blocks, you allow a sort of pre-stretch to take place in your calf and your Achilles. So these essentially elongate, which improves the ability of muscles to produce larger external forces. Research has been done which shows that by doing this you can increase your block velocity so the speed at which your foot leaves the block because of increased forces but without affecting the push duration which is the key thing because anyone can increase your speed by producing more force over a certain time but it's about reducing the time it takes you to produce said force 
There was actually a study which sort of proved the opposite to this. So they said that increasing the inclination angle improved the metrics discussed. So you might hear coaches tell you to make it steeper angle for your blocks, but the blocks used in their study were very different. And this is a big thing. Where along the block you apply force to is actually a big thing. So evidence shows quite unintuitively, I think, that pushing through your rear of your foot, so like the heel, allows you to produce more external force from the blocks. So having a block pad which is like taller than the other block pads that allows you to have your whole foot including your heel up against it is going to allow you to produce more force i feel like i'm doing a terrible job of explaining this right quickly you might have noticed that some athletes rise slowly when the starter calls set there's a reason why a counter movement jump you can jump higher than a static squat jump. So as you bend your knees in a counter movement phase, you're essentially like loading your body a bit like loading a spring ready to spring back. Essentially what happens when you're doing a counter movement is you're like taking advantage a bit of the stretch shortening cycle and this allows you to produce a more forceful contraction because of more excitation of more muscle fibers and the pre-stretch of muscles. And this then results in producing more force for a higher jump. The same principle is going on with these block starts. So the idea is you rise slowly enough so that just as the gun goes, you've got a sort of counter movement going on. If I was to coach an athlete, I'm not a coach, first of all, but if I was coaching an athlete, I probably would stay away from this just because of the risk to reward. Getting a disqualification and overthinking. These are both things which are like obviously bad for performance. So I just thought it was interesting and people might be wondering, oh, why is he, why is he doing that? Maybe I should do that. That's the reason that I think they do it. Okay, so up until now, we've covered a bit on the blocks setup, but now we're going to focus a bit on your body position in the blocks. As I've already mentioned, elite sprinters or high level sprinters move their center of mass closer to the starting line, placing a lot of tension on their shoulders. But also what's interesting is their center of mass is lower, so it's closer to the floor as well. The vertical position of your center of mass relative to the starting line has been seen to separate higher level athletes with lower level athletes. So this might be something to consider as well when your block starts. I will say though, it's hard to know whether a less elite runner would benefit from copying the initial start in position of an elite runner because an elite runner has a massive amount of explosive strength available to them. So they might benefit in a lower position, whereas a sub elite runner might not, if that makes sense, because they have less of this explosive strength. As I mentioned at the beginning, your individual constraints and how your body is built are going to influence how you produce force most effectively. So in terms of joint angles, you need to find the optimal trade-off between producing the most amount of force and the time it takes to do so. Here's where it gets a bit unintuitive again. Better sprinters display slightly longer ground contacts at the start, which allows them to be in contact with the floor more and therefore produce more force because they got a bit more time to do so. They understand like the theory of building momentum up. As it, as they get to max velocity, they are their contact time is going to be shorter than anyone else's. There is a trade-off though, as you can spend too long in contact with the floor for next to no extra benefit. But more on that in part two. This paper here said that a 90 degree rear leg angle, so the angle between your thigh and shin, is optimal for producing the most force. This might have been the case in that study, but I'm about to talk about the reasons that sort of makes sense. Traditionally, it's sort of advised that a rear knee angle of 115 to 135 degrees, somewhere in that range, is optimal. 
having a much more bent leg, like a 90 degree leg, means that the time taken to fully extend the leg increases, right? So by having more time to do this means you have more time to produce more force. Hence, you're going to see more force applied. However, I would strongly argue not to blindly listen to this sort of advice without testing it yourself because it's only worth doing this for sprinters if they're not missing the trade-off between the time taken to produce said force. Think about a vertical jump again. Some athletes will jump the highest, produce the most force from hardly bending their knees at all. Some will squat down to about 90 degrees and produce their highest jump. But it's very, very rare for someone to squat all the way to the floor, like bump to the floor, and produce a higher vertical jump than any of the two previous options. So basically, they're taking more time to move their body further for no extra benefit. If they were in a race, they're already losing time. I hope that makes sense. It's, it's a complicated issue and very individualistic, but I'm just making you aware of all of this. As an athlete or a coach, you need to like get on the force plate, get in a lab and discover which position works best for you to produce the most force in the shortest time. The front and back legs actually act very differently out of the blocks. The rear leg needs to produce higher forces quicker in the initial push off than the front leg. Now we've had a look at optimally setting up the blocks, we're ready for the next phase, which is the push off. As a biomechanist, the first thing I'd look for is horizontal block acceleration. This considers the velocity that you leave, also the time it takes to achieve the said velocity. The reason acceleration is important to consider and not just the velocity is because the velocity of your foot leaving the blocks is going to increase with more force. That gives you no idea as to how much time is taken to produce that force. So I could be in contact with a block for like nearly a whole second producing more force and my foot moves away quicker but the overall time is nearly a whole second slower. Better sprinters actually show both an increased velocity but an increased acceleration as well because they're able to produce larger forces in short times. But like I said, these contact times are much longer than when they're at max velocity. The next consideration to look at in the push-off is the horizontal center of mass projection and the vertical velocities. The two are linked because your body will move both horizontally and vertically at push-off. The best starters seem to be able to produce force mostly horizontally, which means their projection angle is quite low. So their center of mass is still relatively low, i.e. it's more horizontal than vertical. Again, I'm not your coach, but Intuition tells me that this is something you might have to improve gradually rather than all of a sudden because someone tries to have a really low projection angle, then what often happens is an athlete has to overstride to catch themselves from falling over. This completely messes up their joint kinematics and as a result, their joint kinetics as well. This next part, in my opinion, is probably the most interesting part of block starts. So the block exit is essentially all extension movements, but the front and rear leg doesn't actually perform the same. While the front leg extends proximally to distally, so that meaning the hip extends first, followed by the knee, followed by the ankle, the rear leg doesn't do this at all. So your knee actually reaches maximum angular velocity first. Your rear knee is starting in a more extended position than your front knee. I'm just throwing this out there because, well, maybe you need to train the different limbs differently in the gym, for instance. Or if, if you're noticing one foot is better at producing force under certain joints than the other, consider which foot should be your starting foot, etc. To maximize both hip velocities or angular velocities of both hips, which you want to do to generate the most power. You can't just look in the sagittal plane or the side on view, which I'm scared a lot of people do. Femur, abduction and adduction, as well as internal and external rotation, both contribute to increased angular velocity of the hip, which means 3D analysis is essential for determining good block performance.
And if you're looking from the front, you shouldn't see it as a negative that your athlete is rotating their their knees or angles or anything. Obviously, unless you've seen marked decreases in performance from them doing so, because it could actually be helping them produce forces quicker. Again, this is a complex coordinative task and it's not a one solution fits all thing again. So work with your physios, work with your coaches, get in the lab if you can to work out how your body moves to produce the most force for you. The internal joint kinetics. So whenever I say kinetics, by the way, I'm talking about forces. And whenever I'm talking about kinematics, I'm talking about movement, like joint angles, etc. Internal joint kinetics are just as massive for block starts as external kinetics. It's just quite hard to get, get involved in because obviously if you want to accurately measure forces produced in the body, it's quite invasive and you're not going to get any elite sprinters willing to sacrifice their precious bodies for invasive science like that. So a lot of the studies will be based on model estimations. So I don't want to touch too much on that until I've done enough research on it and determined whether it's an accurate enough determination or not. The external kinetics that I've been talking about, so like the forces produced on the blocks, that is all very easy to measure because you can just put force plates in the blocks, force plates on the floor, etc. But yeah, I just want to finish by saying a lot of the information I got to make this video and indeed my other two videos have come from amazing work done by people already in the field. My aim with the channel is obviously to document my own journey, but with the biomechanics and running segment specifically, I just want to share my knowledge, whether that's knowledge I got from reading other people's work or knowledge I got from doing my own research. Just share it out with as many people as possible and hopefully help people learn. Get knowledge widely received. Hopefully it can fall into like the right hands. I want to see a 9.57 run before I die. In the next episode, I'm going to go into the steps after the initial push off. So the first two or three steps or so, and then the acceleration phase from that. Then how long that video gets, I might as also go into accelerating on the bend versus on the straight because different legs do different things on the bed. I hope you enjoyed that and learned something useful. Please do your thing and show your support. Get your comments in below. I really appreciate it. And yeah, thanks for watching everyone. See you in the next one.